Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another installment of APEX Legislative Leadership Series. I'm Madeline Milka, APEX President and CEO. Today, we are proud to present the first of our September sessions, where we will be talking about diversity in sports. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers today, and we're excited to kick it off with opening remarks from Congressman Ami Vera. Congressman Vera represents California's 7th District and is the longest serving Indian American serving in Congress. He is currently a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, where he serves as chairman of the Subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific, and Nonproliferation, and also serves as vice chair of the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. Congressman Barra is a member of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, also known as KPAC, and is the co-chair of their healthcare task force. Congressman Barra is a champion for the API community, and we appreciate his longstanding support of APEX. We are thrilled to have him joining us this afternoon for brief remarks. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Ami Barra. Thanks, thanks, Madeline. You know, as I, I think this is a really interesting topic of API participation in the world of sports. You know, as a South Asian kid who was growing up in, in Southern California, thought I had a pretty good um, outside um, jump shot and was a pretty good basketball player, but yeah, didn't see many folks um, that looked like me or in the API community, um, either in sports ownership or, you know, playing basketball and playing sports. But really, as you've seen over the last couple of decades, you know, my hometown team, the Sacramento Kings, is owned by uh, Vivek Ranadive, a South Asian. Um, you're seeing more baseball players, um, basketball players. You, you've always had a lot of Pacific Islanders playing professional football and, and you know, at a high level in the collegiate um, arena, but you're now also seeing in upper management, you know, more APIs, and you're going to hear from some folks, um, you know, on, on the, the panel that, that will follow me that, that talk about that, sports agents and others. You know, the, the first um, major golf tournament was won by an API um, a couple of weeks ago, Colin Murakawa. So it's exciting to see our community out there competing at the highest level. And, you know, as we're seeing in, in the sports of politics, you know, as you have role models that are out there and the younger generation can see people that look like them, um, they can start to dream that they can compete at the highest level or they can you know, be a general manager of a, a major um, you know, sports franchise or an owner one day. So, you know, a really interesting topic. You know, I find it inspirational. Um, and let me kick it back over to you, Madeline, because, you know, again, I think this is going to be a great century for us. Take care. Thank you, Congressman Barra, for taking the time to join us today and for your remarks. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to recognize Walmart for their sponsorship of this panel. Walmart's sponsorship is in part due to its growing involvement in and support of esports and its players. Through their partnership with Esports Arena, Walmart has brought and continues to bring competitive gaming venues to many of its stores nationwide. We thank Walmart for their sponsorship of this panel and longstanding support of Apex. So let's get this panel started, and I am glad to introduce the moderator for today, Carrie Chow. Carrie is currently the sports anchor for NBC Washington and culture writer and commentator for ESPN's The Undefeated. An award-winning journalist, Carrie joined NBC after becoming the first Chinese-American to host one of the longest-running cable shows in history, ESPN's Sports Center. He is an active member of the Asian American Journalists Association and also runs a mentorship network for APIs interested in sports journalism. He also just finished writing his first screenplay. So if you have questions, feel free to join us uh, through the Facebook comments if you're um, watching us on the live stream on Facebook. And if you are joining us on the webinar, please put your questions in the Q&A chat box. Carrie, I hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Madeline, for the kind words. And I did write my first screenplay, Diversity in Entertainment, a future panel discussion. Um, as Madeline mentioned, I am very passionate about AAPI and about representation. To make a long story short, guys, I grew up with a lot of self-identity and cultural identity issues. I kind of rejected my culture to better assimilate. And that's why it's been a passion and a mission of mine to make sure that that same sentiment doesn't happen to future generations. And that's why it is an honor to introduce our panelists who I will do in alphabetical order. First up, Barry Lee. Barry, you can pop up anytime you want. He is the co-founder and director of eSports for Evolve Talent Agency, a boutique talent agency 
that represents pro video gamers and live streamers. Barry represents professional gamers from around the world. He is a pioneer in the industry that a lot of your kids are dying to get into. And uh, Barry, working in esports, let me ask you, uh, does that mean you also get to play a lot of video games? In my free time, when I have it. Um, when I have it. Well, I mean, I started playing video games when I was seven to the despair of my uh, Korean parents. So I ended up working in the field. Oh, we'll, we'll get into that. There, you have a very interesting path that we will be sure to, to divulge. Um, our next panelist, Jimmy Lin, the co-founder and vice president of Kiss We Mobile and adjunct faculty member at Georgetown University. Jimmy's been in the sports industry for 30 years as one of the pioneers of the digital sports space. He's a longtime VP at AOL, creating partnerships with a virtual who's who in all of sports. There's a good chance you actually know him already. And if any NBA fans out there, you know about Rui Hachimura, who plays for the Washington Wizards, the first Japanese player to ever be drafted in the first round of the draft. Well, Jimmy happens to be a mentor of his. Jimmy, what's that like? Uh, it's, it's fantastic. You know, with Tommy Shepard, the general manager, he, he told me three years ago, he's like, I love this kid, Rui, uh, in Gonzaga. When I get him, you're going to be his big brother mentor. And so I got the text message the draft night uh, and you know, said, be there at the arena the next day. And Rui came with his pink track suit and his mother uh, and little sister came. And I taught Scotty Brooks a couple of words, how to say, uh, Ohio goes, I must, you know, good morning in Japanese. And uh, he's been just a tremendous addition to the Wizards and, and to, to the, whole, the whole city. The city has embraced Rui. Awesome young kid. Uh, finally, our last but certainly not least, Kim Ng, Senior Vice President of Baseball Operations for all of Major League Baseball. Folks, Forbes named her one of the most powerful women in all of sports. She's the first Asian American woman to hold such a position, is the highest ranking female in all of baseball. She's the former assistant GM and VP for both the Dodgers and the Yankees. She used to negotiate Derek Jeter's contracts. Folks, she is a groundbreaker, and I can say this without hyperbole, every move she makes, she blazes a new trail in sports. She's got three World Series rings that she earned with the Yankees. Kim, feel free to pop up. I'm curious, though, with those World Series rings, do you have a favorite piece of memorabilia you own? Well, Carrie, I would have to say that's my World Series trophy from 1998 when the Yankees won 114 games, 125 overall. And um, it was just a, a storybook kind of season for us. One of the most dominant we've seen in the game in and in certainly a very- We make USA time. insurance for veterans. Like um, so here's the, I wanna create a very interactive panel, guys. Um, I know as Asian Americans, we are stereotypically and generally very <laughs> kind and polite to each other, but if, Whoever speaking and making a point, if you feel like you want to chime in, have a question, feel free to chime in because I feel like that's the best way to create an open conversation and an open forum. And as Madeline mentioned, if any one of our attendees has questions, please uh, go ahead and put them in the Q&A and we will do our best to get to as many of them as we can. You know, as for the panel itself, we're going to start this off kind of like a Marvel superhero type thing where we're talking about origin stories. How did you get into the industry? And did you notice you were kind of the only person in the room that looked like you? Um, Kim, I wanna start off with you because I know that you started off as an intern for the Chicago White Sox. I'm curious, uh, how did you not only get your foot in the door, but how did you make sure your presence was felt so that you could progress? Yeah, absolutely, thanks, Carrie. Um, so I went to the University of Chicago and my entire life, uh, my passion was sports, whether it was playing it or watching it. And you could tell through my collegiate career that that was something that I loved to do. I was a collegiate softball player. I was president of the Women's Athletic Association. I was sports editor of the yearbook and the, and the school newspaper. Um, I did my senior thesis on Title IX. So you could really tell that it ran through my blood. Um, it was through a lot of my connections and my network that I had made through my playing career as well as my research on Title IX that I really um, you know, wanted to pursue sports as a passion as well as um, everybody knew that I was looking for a job in sports. So one day the Chicago White Sox actually called down looking for an intern and my former coach 
uh, said to me, are you still looking? And I said, absolutely. She said, well, get your resume down to Comiskey Park because they're looking right now. So printed it out, ran it down there, uh, had two interviews and was hired as an intern. And several months later, I was hired full time. So I was, you know, I was, I was really fortunate, um, you know, at that time when I got the, the, my foot in the door in sports, I was going through all the, you know, regular rigmarole you do after college in terms of trying to get a job. And I was looking, um, you know, in the business sector. Um, thank goodness no one from the financial sector hired me. Uh, we were in a bit of a recession at the time. Uh, and so I was, I was, I landed this internship and it turned out full time. So, you know, throughout my career, I've, I've worked for three different organizations, the White Sox, the Yankees and the Dodgers. As you mentioned, I was assistant GM for, for the Dodgers and the Yankees, um, probably two of the most storied franchises in all of pro sports. Um, and, you know, I was just really fortunate. This is actually my second stint with um, Major League Baseball. I'm now in charge of uh, international development, international baseball development, which we're basically trying to grow uh, baseball around the world. I've been to China several times in the last year and a half, uh, have been to India earlier this year. And so that's you know really what my mission is these days. Uh, Kim, clearly, I, I mean, we've talked about it before, but you are a trailblazer and it is incredible the steps that you've taken. I wanna, we'll come circle back because I'm very curious being as an Asian American woman entering the MLB, what that experience was like when you first came in. Um, but first I wanna go to Barry. I wanna talk about your introduction into the sports industry because for those who don't know, Barry has a master's in biochemistry and molecular biology so your parents must have been crazy disappointed when you said, I'm going into esports. So I was in a PhD program at UCLA um, at the time. And then my research wasn't working out. I was doing research on liver cirrhosis. Um, and then I research wasn't working out. And I told my dad, I don't want to do this anymore. And then, um, and then he was very disappointed because he wanted me to be the first person in our family with a doctorate. Um, so and then the plan was to go to law school and then got into esports because I was bored studying for the LSAT. So and then I just got took a part time job with CJ Entertainment's uh, esports broadcast in Korea while I was studying for the LSAT. And then um, and then yeah, that's how I started in it as making you know fifty bucks a night just translating, doing live uh, interpreting for their broadcast um, from Korean to English. What do you mean you were just bored playing? So you were just bored? And then so, all of a sudden, like, this is the path you've taken? Well, not that I was bored. Oh, maybe bored is the wrong word. It's more that, like, I didn't want to just study 24-7, and I wanted to do something else um, rather than just look at LSAT books and then just do LSAT, you know, test prep the whole time. So and then um, I saw a posting on Facebook because I still watched their League of Legends broadcast all the time. I was a huge fan. And then they had a job opening for a part-time position and I applied. They looked at my resume and said, you know, this isn't a full-time position. And I was like, yes, I'm not looking for one. And then that's how I kind of got in, um, made some connections. And when I went to law school, um, followed up on a lot of those connections. Um, Jimmy, uh, you've been in the sports industry for three decades, three decades plus. Um, I mean, you worked regularly to create strategic partnerships with, you name it, the NFL, the NBA, NASCAR, the, the list goes on. How did you first get into the sports industry? And then also, how have you been able to evolve with the industry? Uh, uh, thanks, Kerry. I mean, I think Kim hit the nail on the head, especially for the younger people, how critical internships are. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm always preaching that to my students at Georgetown, how important the internships are. So, uh, I went both undergrad and my MBA at American. I did six internships in radio and TV back then. Um, but when I started in sports, I just started at the bottom working for the great sports PR legend here, Charlie Brotman, working a radio uh, station, the board ops at night, uh, you know, and, and working my way. But after six years of uh, doing traditional, uh, I had the good chance to go to a small internet company called AOL in 95. And, you know, a AOL blew up over the years um, and it was great. But the first few years, we weren't that aggressive in the sports, but 
um, that, I was like the one man. That, that was my track to make AOL big, uh, sports big at AOL. So, you know, I just recall going to the um, internet sports conferences, which were uh, blowing up in the mid-90s to late 90s, like people from all the leagues and teams and brands and teams, uh, and the private equity guy. And there was always, you know, two Asians in the room. There was uh, Alex Camp from Major League Baseball. And I, I'm half Japanese, half American, uh, half white. Uh, so it was like one and a half Asians in the room all the time. And I just, you know, you're you're, all, you're always there uh, uh, in the minority. Um, and I, you know, I also think of of taking, you know, like Kim, Kim was smart enough to work in big cities, or New York and LA, where there's diversity. But I remember taking trips to go to Kansas City or go to Buffalo, and you you definitely saw how people you know, when you were the only minority in the room. So it was a lot, but, you know, as I tell my students, instead of like complaining about being the only minority in the room, I, I, I asked them to embrace your culture, embrace your background, embrace your diversity. I might used to joke when I started AOL, I wanted to be the highest ranking executive at, at AOL, you know? And, and so those are certain trends that you have. And uh, I, I think instead of using it, complaining about it, I actually embraced it and used it to my benefit. Um, and so, you know, having the opportunity to do global deals at AOL and doing deals in Asia and, and now teaching at Georgetown and creating programs in Asia, I actually embrace the Asian culture and, and you know, use it to my benefit and my company's benefit, whether it's for Kizwi. We, you know, we do a ton of work in Asia, uh, specifically in Korea and Japan, a lot around esports. Uh, and then, you know, my, my business partner, Jung Kim, is one of the top Korean Americans in the world. So we actually embrace our cultural differences. Yeah, it, you're funny. You funny. You mentioned Kansas City and Buffalo as uh, locations without too much um, diversity. I, I started my career off in Wyoming and then moved to Alabama. So those seem <laughs> yeah. like metropolises to me. I don't, know, I don't know what you're talking about. But, but by the way, we, we used to have a, a NASCAR team we sponsored for three years in the early 2000s. And they'd invite me. I said, I'm not going to Alabama. <laughs> Like, uh, I'll go to these, but I don't know what happens if we go to Talladega. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can say that uh, here's the thing that I think we've all encountered when it comes to going to these places with where there are, there is not a lot of representation. It, it, there's a fine balance when you find people who ask you questions out of genuine curiosity. And oftentimes those questions can seem ignorant, but you know they mean well because they haven't had access to different demographics. So that was a lot of times driving my experience in, in Alabama and Wyoming is trying to be open-minded. But of course, there's a certain level too. Um, if someone's flat out racist, then you have to address that. So I'm kind of curious moving on to like, we now know how everyone started, but how did we progress? How did you climb? Because we'd all like to think society is a meritocracy, but it is not. It is, you have to, you have to advocate for yourself in the proper ways. Um, Kim, how did you, especially as an Asian American woman, so now you're dealing with not just the minority aspect, but the gender aspect throughout your entire career. How did you make sure that you were able to keep climbing? Yeah, great question. Um, first off, I, I think I should say that, you know, when I walk into a room, um, people generally notice me first as a woman than, than an Asian. Um, and it was definitely difficult in my industry, particularly the, the area that I'm in, which is baseball operations, because I was typically walking into rooms, you know, of the manager, coaches, and scouts, um, you know, who, who have not typically been the most open-minded. Um, and so th there's definitely an, e an uneasiness when you walk into the room, uh, some discomfort. But I think, you, you know, you, you have to have patience, number one. Um, and, I, and I think that, you know, is critical because you need to win people over, right? And, and you need to, to educate them and you need to show them that you belong, particularly, be, you know, because I was a woman, um, you know, in a man's world, you know, that was, that was uh, of the utmost importance. And, you know, again, these, these are not necessarily just people that you're, you have a meeting with that you don't work with. I mean, I, I had to work with these people every day. So you have to create um, good working relationships. So I would say patience. At times you had to have some thick skin. Um, and then I think, you know, also on my side was an intense motivation to succeed and to prove people wrong. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's ultimately, ultimately been probably the biggest factor that has propelled me forward. Would, have you experienced or at the time, especially in the past, you, you mentioned the boys club, 
were there certain times where you had to endure very uncomfortable conversations in which, if so, how did you react if you had to deal with that? So, um, you know, one of my themes is uh, every day is a battle. You know, and that to me has meant every day I need to win somebody over. I've had to break down some preconceived notion. Um, you know, one of the, one of the, and it's a, it's funny at the time, um, but you know, you still have to go through it every day. Um, not necessarily because I was a woman, but because I was Asian people, if, if I was going to a, a ballpark with, where the security guards didn't necessarily know me, um, they would say, no, no, no media. It, you know, time is over. Are, are you the interpreter? Are you the translator? So, you know, I would definitely get those questions. But again, I think, you know, I think it's about patience. I was one time asked by somebody what country in China I was from. So, <laughs> lovely. <laughs> so that was a little different. Uh, but it, you know, it's really about patience and again, education. Um, you know, I've had plenty of confrontations. I think, you know, in this day and age, you definitely have to have a voice. You have to speak up for yourself. Um, and it's not, you know, it's in the heat of the battle, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in a heated way, but you have to be firm and you have to make your point. And even if you have to, you know, even if you're not necessarily um, comfortable uh, engaging in conflict in a group, you have to take your, um, you know, the, the person, your, your opponent and take them aside and explain your point of view after the meeting or after the situation. But I don't think that we can let these things go again, because it's about education, um, no matter what the circumstances are. You, you know, Carrie, to Kim's point, I'm sure all the panelists have heard this before. It's like, oh, your, your English is pretty good, or you don't have much of an <laughs> accent, you know? Come on, guys. Yeah, and similarly to, to Kim's point about uh, having that patience, but getting those ignorant questions and trying to determine how you react to those. I, it's funny when you said you're what what country in China. Uh, the question I was literally asked was, "Hey, I've heard you refer to yourself as Asian American and Chinese American. So which one are you?" And I was like, mm, "Let me let me explain how that all works." Um, Barry, what about you? What were some of the? Um, how did you climb um, climb up the the, the ladder? Um, I co-founded my own company, so I skipped a lot of it. Um, <laughs> No, but it it's I think I have a I think I'm a little privileged in that like I started in Korea. Um so that, you know, everyone around me was Korean. Um so I speak fluent Korean. I was born in Korea. So a lot of that, um, a lot of the climbing was just it wasn't in like any sort of like, you know, an, you know, some sort of like, you know, racial adversity, like I felt left out. Like so I'm I'm really privileged in that way. But when I came to the US um, definitely, if you look at even our company, you know, the most of the leadership b besides me are, you know, white male. So it's something that what I, I've never felt truly that like, all my life, like, you know, going to school, like, you know, college and stuff like that, there's always tons of Asian people, there's always tons of Koreans, like, you know, Japanese or Chinese people around. And then when I started working, you know, more with kind of people in leadership in the executive positions, that's when I started feeling that there was a little more um, that, you know, I'm definitely, I, I'm actually part of the minority here. So uh, climbing per se, I think a lot of it just came down to um, just not being afraid to be assertive. I think what uh, kind of going to what Kim said, it's just no one's really going to stand up. You can't rely on anybody to stand up for you except yourself. So you have to be willing to, you know, fight your battles, pick your battles and, you know, really find a hill to die on. Um, I've definitely, I've had it easier than most people here, I think. Um, just, be, but at the same time, like, I think it just goes across like, you know, business in general, even if you're working in Korea, you just have to be able to stand up for yourself. Yeah. You want to find the right allies, but at the same time, you can't always rely on them. Jimmy, in, in three decades of doing what you've done in all the different industries and different fields, I can't imagine how many of these battles you have had that we're talking about of being the only, I don't know if necessarily the only POC, but certainly the only Asian American uh, in, in the rooms that you were, you've been in. 
Yeah, uh, uh, before I, I want to get, I'll tell you what one, one quick funny thing that I've dealt with my whole life is, my name is Jimmy Lin. So I'm half, my mother's Japanese, my dad's white from Oklahoma. So he's like Irish, French, German background. I cannot tell you how many people think I'm Chinese and I'm, I'm Jimmy Lin, L-I-N. I actually got sent by Time Warner and Sports Illustrated to Beijing in 2002 for the Olympic Committee meeting for the Olympic sponsors. And I had to meet with the head of the, the uh, a Beijing Olympic Committee, head of marketing. And he started speaking to me in Mandarin. So I had to turn to the lawyer. I said, hey, I'm Japanese, not Chinese. And the lawyer's like, what? Sports Illustrated sent you because they thought you were Chinese, you know? So I just, I mean, that, 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 that's how people think. But, you know, I think the real, for me, the turning point at AOL was when AOL launched the Office of Diversity and Inclusion in 2004. And that was my ninth year at AOL. And, you know, AOL had been around. But, you know, where AOL really embraced diversity. And I, I give lots of credit to Time Warner because Time Warner was a diversity champion. And that, and, you know, having launching uh, Black Voices, which is the top African-American portal, and then AOL Latino, which was the top uh, Hispanic portal, and, you know, ha having people with those backgrounds, program, work, market, do finance was important. And then, you know, the whole thing is you have to fish where the fish are. So in the mid 2000s, as uh, inter internet penetration really, you know, maxed out here in the US, you had to go wh where the growth is. And the growth was clearly in China and India. And so, you know, we launched different um, AOL China platforms. Uh, one was for Chinese Americans, one for mainland China, one, for, one was for uh, Chinese in Hong Kong, one for Chinese in Taiwan. And a lot of people just lumped that together. And that was really a growth and learning experience for me about how you really need to, to pay attention to the to specific cultures. And, and that, that's where you grow. So that's been, that's been great for me. And I, I've used that, you know, um, at Georgetown, I, I, I I teach and mentor a lot of students and a lot of minority students. I talked about this in the call earlier. It's funny with, you know, so many Asian students will have, hey, you know, Jimmy, Professor Lynn, I have the Asian parents. You got to be a lawyer, banker, or doctor. Like, that's what we're told. And, I, and I'm like, no, you don't. Like, follow your, like, follow an area of passion, right? Do what you want to do. And it, maybe that's not what your parents are telling you, but, you know, that's how you, you, you find success in life. And, you know, I, I, I laugh and say, these people say to me, Hey, now when I Google, I use your name. I tell my parents, like, Jimmy, you're like a trailblazer in sports. I said, no, man, I'm just old. But, and, and I am old, a few years older than Kim. But I, even though I just met Kim in the past week, I've used Kim's name many times to my students in the past about, you know, being a trailblazer. And, like, you know, like, obviously she followed an area of passion. And sports has always been my passion. That's, that's what I've done. So to be able to work in sports, to be able to teach sports, to work in sports philanthropy, to produce sports films, you know, you, you know you're following your area of passion. Jimmy, go, uh, um, Jimmy, going off of the thing you're saying, like you got to fish where the fish are, like I think yeah. kind of adding on to that, it's like if you can speak another language or even have the opportunity to learn another language, it, it's really, really, really helpful because um, I, one thing I regret is learning, honestly, learning Japanese instead of Mandarin when I was in college. And I, I, I agree. You know, my, my, my longtime mentor and close friend is Ted Leonsis, who's our former AWOL president, who's a majority owner of Monumental, you know, the Wizards, the Caps, the Mystic, mm -hmm. Team Liquid. Um, and he's a Georgetown grad. He's coming to my class many times to guest lecture. And the one, I always know that he, he tells the students, one of the things that I want you to do is learn a second language, either learn Spanish or Mandarin, yep. right? Spanish obviously goes what's happening in the U.S. with Ma Mandarin globally. I mean, to Barry, so to your point, exactly. exactly. I mean, for me, it was just that, like, you know, when you see someone abroad and they speak English to you, you're always kind of happy to hear it. And you always want to like kind of engage with them. And it's the same way, other way around. And if you, even if you're like Mandarin or like, you know, a different language that you're speaking that you're trying to use, isn't super fluent. It just breaks down barriers. It breaks, it breaks the ice so easily. So I think, um, you know, if you can, if you have the opportunity to learn another language, even just a little bit, it really does help a lot. And for me, like kind of, I leaned on the fact that I speak Korean because there's a ton of Korean esports athletes. So you just got to lean into your skill set as hard as you can. Hey, Jimmy, to your point about passion, um, you know, as we all know, sports is most definitely uh, an industry of glamour. Um, it's not necessarily why I got into it. Um, but it definitely explains why when we started out in it, we just didn't make a whole lot of money um, because they can do that. Uh, so very much to my tiger mom chagrin, um, I wasn't making much money. And so early on in my career, when I worked for the White Sox, I would say 
once a month, she would send me an article about getting an MBA or getting a JD and what are you doing? Um, those articles stopped though, once I became assistant GM of, of the Yankees. And uh, in some of my interviews, you know, particularly the Asian publications, you know, I said, well, thank goodness I didn't listen to my mom. Oh, I mean, we, we all know Asian moms, right? I mean, they, they, they want to do it for, for the kids, but it's all about themselves too, right? They want to brag to their friends like, oh, my daughter works for the Yankees. They're the world champion. Like, I don't ever know my mom knew what an NBA was, what AOL, she had no email, but my son, Jimmy, he has this and she'd always get it wrong. But, you know, for Asian moms, a lot of it's like, it's, it's pride, it's pride for the kid, but it's also pride for themselves. By the way, my mom is listening right now. So, <laughs> hey, mom. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if you guys had. I don't know if you guys had like these this kind of experience. But like when I told my dad I wanted to go into gaming, he literally threw a candlestick at my head. Like he was not happy because my dad is like super white collar Silicon Valley tech type of guy, and then so he was. He was not happy to hear that when I first said it. Now he's a little bit okay because I sent him articles like esports is a billion dollar industry and I keep like feeding him stuff like that. So he's a little more okay with it. But when he, when I first told him, he was not happy. And I, I think, I, I think so we hard. all probably had these conversations with, with our parents in these similar type things. I, I also though, I want to throw in a point that I understand where they're coming from too. It's So we make these jokes, but we also understand the, the parents, like, they want what's best for their kids, and they know going to these other, when you follow your passion, it could be a very difficult, diff, difficult path. Kim, as an intern in the, with, with the White Sox, I had to leave everything I knew to go to Wyoming and um, in, in Alabama. And, you know, you leave and you make these tremendous sacrifices. And, you know, I was making $19,000 a year. But then you also know what you're doing, right, as a part of this journey. And ultimately, the goal is to show what's possible, right? This is why representation matters so much, because we don't know what is possible. Then you see people like Kim, Barry, and Jimmy, and you realize, hey, okay, we have to do a better job of telling people what we're doing and showing that the representation has started. And so my question next is, how do we do a better job of improving the representation in sports industries? And Jimmy, I'll, I'll start with you because there's a quote from John Thompson, uh, who the Georgetown legend, uh, legendary coach who recently passed. And he said, we don't want the right to succeed. We want the right to fail. And I think that encapsulates um, what minorities, what BIPOC trying to navigate into different industries. I think that encap encapsulates the idea perfectly. Uh, Jimmy, what, what do we need to do to improve the representation in sports industries? Well, well first off, th thank you for mentioning Coach Thompson. I mean, he, he's a hero of mine. I've actually been a neighbor of his for the last 18 years. I live three townhouses down from him. Good friends with his son, John, uh, JT3, and his wife, Monica. And, such a big loss, but I really love uh, reading about the diversity and what a champion he was for diversity. Many, many years before all these, these protests, I mean, he was out there doing this in the late 80s. Um, but really, I, I think that's one of the beauties of social media is that we're able to get our story out there. And I think doing these type of events, doing these webinars, doing this on Facebook Live, everything we post on Instagram and Twitter, I know that that has an effect on, on, uh, on, on the younger generation, knowing that there are people that look like us that, that can be in, you know, in positions. And I, I think that's, that's very important, you know, and I, and I think back, you know, this is, this is for Kim's mom and she mentioned title nine. One, one of the coolest things I did, I worked as an informal sports advisor for the Obama white house for, for many years, just behind the scenes connector. And I remember the second year, uh, the office of public engagement reached out to me and said, Jimmy, we want to celebrate title nine. It's never been celebrated at the white house. Can you like, who should we invite? And we had a week to go. And so we invited a bunch of people. And I remember Valerie Jarrett sitting there with our, uh, Arnie Duncan, Secretary of Education, and Billie Jean King. And, and I remember Valerie Jarrett saying, 39 years, this is the first time it's been celebrated. I guarantee you the rest of our administration will be celebrated every year. And I remember Christine Brennan sitting in the front seat, you know, who's, who's such a Title IX world expert, you know, said, holding back her tears saying, this, this is powerful. So to Kim's mom, I mean, being involved in Title IX is so critically important. As Christine Brennan said, it's probably the most important law that's passed in the, in the last 50 years. So I think, you know, people that embrace culture and, and, and embrace diversity, because Obama White House, it wasn't just the, uh, the, the Title IX. I remember 
we actually went and rallied and, and met with them specifically at AAPI. The first time we had a diversity meeting, they, they threw the Asians in the room with African Americans and Latinos. I think that's great. We all have our own issues. So we actually had to lobby and have a, a separate meeting, which we did with, uh, with Secretary Lou, which, which, which is important. Jimmy, I was at that celebration, so thank you oh, very wasn't much. Wasn't that amazing? Oh, great. Yeah. Wasn't that amazing? Like all that with the, yeah. Um, Kim, I mean, can you, you, you're looking specifically right now developing the sport in other countries. Um, when it comes to representation and creating that more diverse talent pipeline, um, not just on the field, certainly, but also, you know, on the executive level, how, what are tangible steps that we can make, um, cross industry to try to improve uh, representation? Look, I think there's a number of thing, things. I think, you know, as Jimmy said, we have to be out there. Um, I, you know, coming, you know, from an Asian family and, and you know, with typical Asian um, characteristics, one of them is to be very humble. And I think that's probably been one of my, um, you know, issues is that I don't necessarily want to get out there and you know, thump my chest about what I've done in my career. But I do think at this point in time, it is really important for people to see who you are and what you represent. And I think deep down, we all have to acknowledge that and we have to, um, we have to be proud of it. And we, we do, we need to be out there. So um, I actually did a panel probably five or six years ago and, we, and our mission was to write a letter to our younger selves and basically the, the end of my letter was that I needed to get out there and make sure that you know, a lot of these young girls saw me and a lot of these young women who were you know, dying to get into the sports industry um, saw me. So to be visible is, is one of the most important things. I think um, you know, on my end, one of the things that I try and do is really to support the, the, the young women and you know, women across the board at MLB. So I'm the executive sponsor of our women's resource group business resource group. Um, I'm very involved in, in our diversity committee. I served on the ownership diversity committee six, seven years ago. Um, I currently serve on the diversity committee, helping our, um, you know, all of our initiatives, helping our CDO get the message out there. MLB in the last four or five years has done a really nice job in terms of coming up with different programs. Um, one is called Take the Field, which we've had two of them now that happens at our winter meetings, geared specifically towards young women trying to get into our, into our business. Um, we have the Diversity Pipeline Program, which is MLB as well as the 30 clubs trying to place people of color as well as women um, with you know, all 31 different organizations. And then we have a really involved program, um, the Diversity Fellowship Program, where, we, where we've hired I would say anywhere from 18 to the low 20s um, fellows every other year, and they go through a 24 month program um, with individual clubs as well as some of, with MLB, learning in depth all the different facets of baseball operations. So, those are some of the ways, you know, and I, I'm very active. I do think that we need to be out there just so people can see us and understand what we do and, and who we are. Jim, if you need uh, any help hyping, I got you. <laughs> I will hype the hell out of you. <laughs> All right, let's talk after this. <laughs> I think um, the thing to keep in mind is that like once not like I, I would say like the what's the really trite saying is like be the change you want to you want to see um, a lot of once you have the ability and the kind of the the ability and the power to kind of push for certain programs like you really have to be the person that you know is proactive pushes forward a lot of these programs so like it's great to see that you know kim does a lot of this stuff and for on my end is you know when we hire at our agency when we try to pick out our junior agents i really am mindful on like you know who can i who can i bring in that is not only an asset to our agency but an asset to us culturally like give us a more diverse um diverse viewpoint so I think that really keep being mindful of that and keeping that in mind, um, especially when you're positioned to hire people and is such a big thing. The other thing that I wanted to kind of add on to everything, um, kind of something that I alluded to earlier is a lot of times there are these programs in place, but we just don't know about them, right? Our parents 
don't know about them. And I think it's essential that we find better ways to make sure we push out the idea that there are these ta talent pipeline programs. For As I run um, a journalism, a sports journalism outreach mentorship program, I've noticed like that is one of the difficulties we have is telling people, we've got scholarship money for you to get you down this path, but people don't know about it. So I, I think it's important that to everything that you guys are saying, be the change you want and then advocate, speak up about that change and make sure publicize that change, right? Um, I do wanna to get to a couple questions really quickly um, from, our, from our viewers. And uh, Barry, this question's for you. Um, Joanne is asking you, are there challenges for women in esports? Yeah, there's tons of challenges. I think it's just, an, it, it, a lot of it's very similar in general, but I think one of the big things is, um, one of the big kind of talking points I've seen about esports in general is how the athletes are all male and there's not a lot of female athletes in a sport that's not where physical differences aren't, don't seem to be a huge thing. And I currently represent um, a female player, what was it, uh, Aspen, who's playing in kind of like the tier two Overwatch scene. Um, and she's trying to get to the tier one level. And a lot of the challenges for her is that when she's even just playing the game normally and her voice comes out, there's a lot of like kind of, you know, the typical sexist gamer commentary that you see a lot of. And she, she definitely faces some of that. And um, as on the athlete level, yeah, there's a huge amount of issues and kind of, there's not a lot of people like you around you at the highest level. So it's hard to find the right support um, to kind of keep going. And on like kind of the business side, you know, like, like I said before, it's, since it's so heavily white male dominated, um, sometimes, you know, women can feel that they don't have the right support from above. Like they don't have like the viewpoints, their viewpoints are often ignored. Um, I think the good thing about esports where it is currently, you know, there's a several teams that have, you know, the president of Fly, the president of FlyQuest Gaming, which is uh, owned by the uh, Milwaukee Bucks ownership group. They have actually, um, they have actually a female president. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of women that are kind of stepping into positions of like kind of um, executive positions. So there's a lot of challenges just like in any other industry. And I think, but in esports on the business side, it's a little bit easier on the player side, on the athlete side, it's still very difficult. Hey, hey, Carrie, if I can add to that, um, about five years ago, Red Bull came to Washington DC and they were uh, having a tournament here. Um, they asked me if they could host an event in Georgetown. So we hosted an event on the, on the Thursday night and uh, we had uh, three or four of the famous uh, esports people. But one of the, the gentlemen, Steve Place here in DC who was working with Red Bull said, hey, can you help, you know, like with this conference, like what should we do? I said, you should actually study the best practices of the traditional leagues of the NFL and NBA and Major League Baseball and, and, and NHL. And the one, one issue that, you know, that came up is you know, that so many of the players are males, right? And so what can we do? And, and, I, and I actually explained during the conference how the leagues have done a great job of embracing the female market. So, I mean, you see what Major League Baseball has done, the NBA has done, the NFL has done, increase the, the female audience. I think, I think it's fantastic, right? And, uh, you know, whether it's celebrating uh, Women Heritage Month or whatever you're doing. And so, you know, to, the, to their credit, in the la last year of the Obama White House, you know, I, I, I actually talked to Steve Place and said, you know, how about doing something geared towards more towards women so you can get more women uh, involved in these sports and they're dealing with a bullying issue. So they actually held a summit on, on women in esports uh, in, in the last year of the Obama White House. And those are the types of things you need to do to, to, to raise awareness and, and get people out there. And, you know, even and going back to Kim, and, you know, she, she's got a great reputation. She may not want to get out there, but it's almost like so important for her to get out there because she really is such, such a trailblazer. And the more her story gets told, the, the more like young Kims are going to follow in her footsteps. Yeah, one thing that I kind of want to touch on, because I know we, we often talk about mentoring the students and starting them off in a certain path. But what about people who are interested in sports, who have already been, who are mid-career? How do we attract or, you know, if we're talking to, if we have uh, mid-career people who are watching in this panel, if they want to get into sports, what are, tactical ways and suggestions that you would have for them to get into um, into the sports industry? Uh, I, I can jump on that one. So I, I'm one of the original uh, founders. We built a master's program in sports management at Georgetown 12 years ago. 
And it was really targeted to groups. It was targeted to students that just graduated college and did no internships in sports. And it's really hard to find a job when you haven't done any internships. And a lot of it is former college athletes who, who were too busy practicing and playing, they couldn't do it. So that's one. But the other part is actually people that want, that want to make a pivot, a career change. And I, I think, you know, going to a one-year gra graduate program in sports management uh, is, a, is a, you know, it's, it's a way to do it. And I, you know, I have one example, uh, Katina Lee, who played softball at Harvard with one of my mentees, Amy Reinhardt, and she went on to become a lawyer. I mean, she joined our sports management program, you know, probably a dozen years out of college, and she wasn't elated being a lawyer, but she wanted to get in sports. She, she took our program and she got a uh, internship with uh, Damon Jones at the Washington Nationals, the general counsel, right? And then she ended up running, you know, CEO of our Nationals, uh, Washington Nationals Youth Baseball Academy. And there's a great example of someone that's making a career change. So I, I think, you know, you obviously have to get something on your, on your resume. So whether it's that degree or the internships, th those are one of the ways that, that, you know, you make that career change. I, I want to add on as well. It's like, uh, I think, uh, kind of what I said earlier is that you got to lean on your skill set because, for example, if you worked in finance, if you worked as a lawyer, if you work, you know, some sort of like other field, there's always skills that or skills or um, that you have used in your current career that are applicable in sports. For example, if you're finance, you know, sports teams need financial analysts. They need, you know, accountants. They need all of these things. They need lawyers. Um, they need doctors because of uh, could take care of the players. So there's always an opportunity. It's just a matter of how hard you look for it and just kind of like there's or how you sell your uh, skill set to the employer. I think that's something that people need to keep in mind is that there's always an analog. There's always some sort of way you can apply what you've done before to a new job, especially in sports. Yeah. What, what Major League Baseball is doing, I mean, they're at the forefront of analytics, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, obviously it started with, with Moneyball, but, you know, there's, 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 there's such a recruitment of young, smart financial minds that, that work in Major League Baseball because the analytics game and, and also just, frankly, as the traditional media deals end up going more to direct to consumer, there's even more need for, for analytics uh, in, in the sports. Kim, you probably received who knows how many people reaching out to you saying, hey, I want to get in, I want to do this, I want to do that. What when they send you a resume, when they send you an email, what are the things that you're looking for that will stick out in your, in your head, in your mind? Um, I, you know, and this is part of my background, being an athlete. Um, I think when you're an athlete, particularly on the collegiate level, I think that says a lot about you in terms of work ethic, discipline, being able to perform under pressure, teamwork, so that for sure stands out to me. Um, you know, Jeff, Jimmy alluded to uh, this um, in the prior question. You know, there, there's definitely a strong movement towards the analytics side. So if you're young and you've just gotten out of college, I would make sure that you highlight uh, coursework in analytics, you know, computer programming. I think that for sure is an eye opener for someone looking at resumes. Um, but I would say those two things in particular. Uh, we've got another question for Barry. Um, any advice for young AAPI professionals for getting involved in esports, and how can we combine efforts in public policy space? Um, for getting involved, I think I'll, it's it's like the same advice that everyone gives, and that no one really wants to hear. It's like you know, start with the internships, look for these job opportunities. Um, you have to be very proactive and aggressive in looking for opportunities. So like look at all the teams, look at kind of like the job openings that are available, get your foot in the door. And once you're there, you have to network so hard. I think it's, I used to think because, you know, I was a researcher working in a basement, you know, working with mice, like, oh yeah, networking, who needs that? And then once I moved into kind of like, you know, um, the entertainment space and even, even the legal space, cause I went to uh, GW law, is that networking is everything. So once you're in there, you really, it's, it's so hard and it's exhausting, but you have to keep putting yourself out there, meeting people, creating connections. And then even then, it's not enough to just meet people. You also have to come up with some sort of like story or the way to sell yourself that people will remember. And the hardest part is that if you overdo it, then they forget you because you overdid it because they don't want to hear about it anymore. So it's, 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 it's tough, but the thing is, the best advice I can give you is that you have to be proactive. Find these programs that, you know, Carrie, you were talking about. Find these programs on these um, talent pipelines. 
and then you know just really just keep putting yourself out there. Hey, hey Kara, I, I can't stress that uh, how critical the networking is. I mean, that, that's what I do as a job. Is I, I'm a networker, and I did that at AOL. I, I do that at Kiswi. I do that at Georgetown. But you know, that's one of the things I found most with my Asian students at Georgetown is their lack of networking and. Uh, you know, get it. And I'm like, you got to get out of your comfort zone. You got to stretch yourself. That's how you do it. So I actually will take my Asian students to conferences, not just sports, but any conference and actually um, make them, I'll go up and introduce them executives and, and I, you know, coach them up on, on what to say. And then, then as importantly is how you follow up. And, you know, I, I tell them, you know, like, you know, when I was growing up, there, there was no social media, right? So like, how would you get in contact with a president or a CEO? But now with LinkedIn, you're, you're one click away. So it, it you know, it, it is a lot easier. So like if people in the past want to reach Kim, it'd be very hard to reach Kim, but now they can reach Kim or Barry, you know, through Twitter, you know, through, through LinkedIn and the different social media platforms. So networking is something that agents aren't comfortable doing uh, generally, but the more they do it, the better. I couldn't agree more with, uh, so in, in sports media, in journalism, networking is like every industry, that's how you move up. And I will also say like going to those, finding those organizations and these conferences and conventions, non COVID time granted, but even, <laughs> you know, it, it, this still works and you can find people and message them. But when you go to those events and they'll cost X amount of dollars. And when you're young, and you're a student, you have no money. I know I grew up on instant ramen. I, I'm addicted to that stuff. I still, you know, I still eat it. And the thing is, sometimes you have to pony up. Sometimes you have to make that sacrifice because it'll open the door to meet Kim, to meet Barry, to meet Jimmy. And it's those opportunities. And then not just to meet them, but to reiterate what everybody's saying, to follow up and to follow up in a smart, strategic way, not sending a generic email, to everybody that you just met at this convention. Find a pinpoint in the conversation that really resonated and reference that, and then send that email or phone call or whatever it is um, in that regard. Uh, another question that we have is, a lot of Asian American students do well in football, basketball, soccer, and other sports to high school. Then the focus in college is all about academics. How can we change tradition and also how can we get other minorities who dominate these sectors? I, I think things should change dramatically. I mean, I, I have two students that, that are here on the, in this webinar now. Um, uh, Sari, who plays basketball for us, who's half Korean, uh, half African-American, and Harry, who's a, who's a Chinese-American tennis player. I, I think things are changing. I mean, Georgetown won the national championship in soccer last year. Carrie, you told me you gave the shout out, right? There's a, a freshman Chinese-American player who, who scored a goal in the, in the, in the uh, extra time. So I, I was like, who is that? Let's talk about him. <laughs> the, 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 but th things, are, things are definitely changing, I think, in, in, in sports. So I don't think you're as pigeonholed. And, you know, once you do, if you do become a student athlete, I mean, there are opportunities. I, I mean, I'm seeing that at Georgetown, maybe it's different other schools, but there are opportunities a, a, across the board. Like one of my favorite things about at Georgetown is we now have five Samoan and Tongan players. And of course, those are all the boys I'm mentoring. They're, they're family to me. So I, I think the, the opportunities are growing uh, in a big way. I think the on the changing tradition part of it is that tradition is changing um, slowly but surely as like the world becomes more interconnected. Um, people like, I think the thing that helped me a lot is to kind of show success stories um, to my parents. And I think like if you're really passionate about something, if you really want to, you know, kind of make a career out of your passion, uh, but your parents are opposed to it, I think you just need to find the success story saying, look, there is a, is, there is a pathway for success in this sector. And then, you know, I can, you know, so there is, there is a, there definitely is like a upside to what I'm trying to do as a passion. And I think it's something I want to pursue. And if, and I think that's one way to help kind of like with the parent side of it with, and sometimes they'll be so stubborn that you can't do anything about it, but it's something you can do. Look for success stories, case studies. Everyone loves a good case study, so. Yeah, I think, you know, for me, um, I'll tell you guys this story. So I think, so as we all move up, you know, our organizations or in the sports world, um, you know, we keep a lookout for other Asian Americans. You know, Carrie, you just mentioned it. I will tell you in my time with the Dodgers. So now the Dodgers are um, my favorite team uh, because in particular, they were, they're pioneers. 
um, in their space, whether it was Jackie Robinson, Hideo Nomo, um, Chan Ho Park. And I will tell you in the nine years that I was with the Dodgers, we had 13 Asians on our roster during that time period. And so for that one club, for the Dodgers, that represented 20% of all Asians during that time period. And that was because we had an Asian operations department. And that really came from the top with Mr. O'Malley, you know, early on in those years, but, you know, ownership groups afterwards really following that tradition and understanding how important those Asian markets were and are. Um, and, you know, it really was, it was a commitment. It was an ideal and it was a philosophy. So I think, you know, as all of us, you know, Barry, you in particular, you know, as you go through your career, um, you know, you very much are at the forefront and you are going to keep a lookout and, you know, you're, you're going to give all the consideration in the world that you can um, for those that are like you. Um, and so I think that makes a huge difference in what we do. You know, you know, Carrie, one of the things my friends and I tried to form about 12, 11 years ago was um, creating an Asian leadership network of, of uh, to get more Asians in the boardroom in the C-suite. And, you know, part of that discussion came is because the Asians, you know, I was trying to do that in D.C. because the Chinese and the Japanese and the Koreans, they, they, a lot of the groups don't work well together. So I was <laughs> trying to create, no, seriously, a black tie event uh, with all the different community business leaders, and it would benefit the low-income first-generation Asian immigrant children in D.C. And I, I met a bunch of friends in L.A. That, that, that had the same passion, and that's why we were meeting with the White House, you know, back then. We're, we're trying, trying to create this type of thing. And I mean, I look at this panel now, having people of Chinese blood and Korean blood and, and uh, Japanese blood and Indian blood. I, I, I think, you know, it's fantastic when that, we're here together. And that, that's to Kim's point. I mean, as we raise up in profile, the more we can recruit, teach, and mentor, the better. Here's a, this is a sentiment that I often experienced. And I hope, I, I'm going to throw this out there. And I want you guys to just comment on what you make of it. Because I find when I was climbing in my industry, a lot of times the sentiment whether it's with Asian Americans, I will, ref I will say that in this sentiment, it is with Asian Americans. It's if I could make it, if I could climb up and make it and do it myself on my own, then that's great. But I'm not going to help you out because I was able to do it. So why can't you do it? And that was a problem that I saw so much throughout my career until I finally joined the Asian American Journalists Association. And I realized, we're not alone. We can help each other. And how do we create real representation is by helping each other. Because if you're one person's doing this on his own, one person's doing this on her own, then you don't have that type of ultimate representation that you're really looking for. Are those issues that you have found in your experience? I mean, in my experience, when I see people talk about things like, oh yeah, I did it all on my own. I think they're incredibly lacking self-awareness because there's always somebody that looked at your resume and said, oh, something in this resume resonates with me. And maybe it was just like a short conversation you had at some point or something like that. So it's like, there's always, nobody ever truly does anything alone. Um, so that when somebody says like, oh yeah, I didn't have any help. So why should I give other like people that are coming behind me help? Like, it's just an incredible, I just think of it as like an incredible lack of self-awareness. Um, and nobody should ever think of it that way. Um, and especially if anybody, you know, watching this ever feels, you know, that like they've made it on their own. Like you got to think about your parents, you got to think about your friends, you got to think about people around you and they've all contributed in some small way to you who being who you are. I, I, I jump on that and I, I posted this recently. You know, I just think about having a Japanese mom who never never worked until I went to college and now she went to work at a local department, uh, Garfinkel's. Now she used to come home and cry sometimes at dinner because ignorant people would make fun of her accent or, or, or just, just say really racist, ignorant stuff, which is more common nowadays right now. And, and part of my, you know, reason to want to give back and help others is, is, is because my mother who passed away three years ago. And so Carrie, I had this discussion with you. I focus on mentoring on uh, minority children at Georgetown in the inner city. I have two Chinese American immigrant kids I met 12 years ago. I'm, I'm putting them through college. Uh, the brother graduated in Maryland two years ago, first generation college student. His sister started her senior year. That to me is, is my drug, is, is helping others 
And, and I always say like, whenever you mentor, the mentor gets more, gets, gets more than the mentee. Everyone thinks the mentee benefits, the mentor benefits because you're getting the pride and the ful fulfillment. And when you see the growth and the maturation, that to me is, is, is what it's all about. So the more we help collectively, again, the better we all are. Yeah, absolutely. I, I completely agree you know, with both of you guys. Um, yeah, I can tell you that I think one of the, the true reasons I got hired, um, well, you know, my, my resume is well, but um, my boss, his wife was a sports producer at the time. And knowing what she had gone through at that level in dealing with the athletes and, you know, and, and everybody in that production room, um, you know, I think he was very sympathetic and he knew um, that, that we would have to hold ourselves to a different standard and that's not necessarily right. And mm -hmm. so, you know, in terms of um, the other candidates, uh, this is actually a funny story in terms of the other candidates, they actually had hired a football player. Um, he was like a 300 pound uh, offensive lineman and his name was Tiny. Um, <laughs> but they actually, they had given the internship to Tiny. Um, but when my boss came back from vacation and he learned who the, you know, who they had picked to get the internship, he stepped in and said, no, 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 no. You know, this is the, clearly the, the better candidate with the better resume and, you know, this needs to go to her. So okay. again, it, it was, you know, I think it was really about, you know, him having a wife who had gone through a lot of those trials and tribulations in her career. I think all of us in our careers experience that there's always those kinds of lucky moments where somebody above had something that resonated with them. And I think what people should really think about is when you're in the position to hire, like you want to become that lucky factor for somebody else. And so like, it's never like, it, maybe it's like a little demeaning to call it luck, but at the same time, it's like, you don't know about these things. So it feels like luck to you at the time. So I think it's just really like, you want to be the person that really influences and like, you know, makes, makes somebody in your, the position that you are in their, their life better. And really just creating the opportunities is the best thing that we can do. Kim, I want to kind of harp on your comments and then also combine it with the question that just um, from one of our attendees is what's the most important lesson you've learned as a woman and a person of color in sports? Well, there's, there's a lot of them. Um, to narrow it down to one, I think I would have to go here. Um, you know, as a woman and as a minority in this field, you represent. You must always know every minute of the day that you represent. And so that means being extraordinarily well prepared, you know, out preparing others. Um, it means that at times, you know, you are going to have to speak up when you don't necessarily want to, but it, it means a lot of things. Um, but, you know, in some ways you, you will, you have, a, you will have a target on your back. Um, you know, there are going to be lots of guys that you're competing against and, you know, you're friendly and, and all that, but you know, they also want the promotion. So you're going to have to go extra hard and, for and you know we've all heard the stories you know particularly for women that you know you will just be judged by different standards so i will say you know representing these two groups you just have to be on your game all the time all the time have thick skin um and have a voice it's always better to be over prepared i think too always yeah I a hundred percent. Like when I, when I go into locker rooms and, and this is the thing, how many times have you heard this stupid comment? Like, Oh, a woman's never played football. So she doesn't know. And you're just looking at them. Like you are such an idiot, but like, it's the same concept that c continues to perpetuate, right? This problem of, Hey, you haven't been there. So you don't know. That's why you have to do all that additional homework, all that additional work to, to show yourself. Because even though, it's not fair and it's not right. That's what, that's, that's what it is. That's, that's it is. exactly, exactly. Um, we got a questions. Um, I'm curious now about, we talked a lot about inclusive uh, inclusion and inclusivity. Um, 
I'm curious, how do you, um, how do you balance allyship? How do you show better racial allyship with the black community, um, especially right now in terms of um, our profession? I don't know if that question makes sense. Does that question make sense? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll okay. jump on. I mean, to me, it's easy. I mean, a majority of the student athletes I mentor at Georgetown are African American. Um, but, you know, in, in my discussions, and I've been having diversity and inclusion uh, speeches with a lot of the teams at Georgetown, is, is I know what it's like um, being, being a minority, being the only, only person in the room. And, you know, a, a speech I gave a couple years ago to all 500 student athletes that are try being biracial. I mean, if you're biracial, you're really in the minority. I mean, me being half Japanese, half white, like growing up in Tokyo, I was always like half American. I moved to DC, I'm always half Asian. I mean, literally the only place in the world where I'm in the majority is Hawaii, you know, with, with about 75, 78%, you know, mixed Asian blood. So, you know, I know what it's like. Um, and so it, it goes back to what, what I tell the students, whether they're African American or Latino or Asian, it's like, embrace your culture, embrace what you're about, you know, with, with what's going on Black Lives Matter. I've been encouraging the students to really do a deep dive into their parents' background, their grandparents' background, get that on video. And like, now, you know, we have time because everyone's pretty much stuck at home. Find out about your, your background. And, you know, I've been going back to Japan every year and I pepper my aunts with questions about my Japanese background for, for many years. And, and you know, I, I write it down. I, I take the video down because I, I think it's important. So I, I think there are definitely, you know, corollaries between the, the different minority groups. I also just, I, I don't think it's like, you don't need to necessarily frame it as like, as Asian Americans, what should be, what should, you know, what is our place in it? I think it's, everyone has a place in it, right? Like you just have to be, you know, be a good ally, um, you know, keep your mind, like keep, be open-minded about a lot of things, extend the same opportunities you would um, to any other person. And just, just trying to be as helpful as possible, I think is, is just really what it comes down to at the end of the day. And I think what really helps in a lot of these conversations is just really have a lot of empathy and think about what it is like for, you know, person in those shoes, like really just try to think about what, what things are like, what things might be in that, in that specific situation. And, and I think that's what needs to happen a lot more. People need to be more like um, reflective, I think about these issues because maybe you didn't think too high, like, you know, think too much of it at the time, but there's always situations in your life where you think about, Oh wait, that was incredibly offensive at that time, but I didn't, I just brush it off. So yeah. And then, so you have to kind of just think about the situations reflect and then really just try to like, like I say, again, be the change you want to see. Uh, I would say, um, so interestingly, my department um, definitely has a very strong diversity component to it. So we're baseball and softball development. Um, and so a large part of our department, we are trying to provide access to those who are underserved, underrepresented um, in terms of baseball access. So we actually had a staff meeting, um, I would say probably a month ago. And our boss really just wanted to get a feel for where we were during um, the BLM time we are in. And it was, a, it was a very tough discussion, but you know, from, from what we saw, you know, a lot of people opened up um, about how they were feeling. Uh, you know, from my end, you know, I talked about COVID and how during the COVID times, you know, being an Asian, um, it's, it's been a little bit nerve wracking at times, you know, where you, know, you read and you hear a lot about you know, the violence and, you know, the prejudice that you've, you know, that Asians have encountered. And so I think by, by talking openly and transparently, um, I think the rest of the people in my department sort of got a very different perspective of, you know, racism, because we, you know, right now during this time, we, we tend to think about it in terms of the Black Lives Matter um, situation. But, you know, several people at that time just said, wow, you know, thanks for giving a different perspective. And I think because there was, you know, a perceived vulnerability on my end, I think that um, helped people to sort of embrace me and that I would have an understanding of how they were feeling. So I do think by, by opening up and talking about it, you know, and making yourself available to others, um, 
you know, there's definitely a common bond in, in terms of how we all deal with a lot of this. No, I mean, uh, go ahead, Carrie. I was just going to say, we all, empathy, right? Uh, empathy and open, honest conversations are so important um, during this time. And I think it's also a recogni recognition of certain levels of privilege, right? Like, we, we have all this conversation, the, the stupid suffering Olympics. Are you guys familiar with the term about the suffering yeah. Olympics, where, right? One race suffers more than, and it's like, okay, um, we suffer from all sorts of racism, especially right now during COVID-19, right? But then what is the privilege that we do have? When we are pulled over by police, is our, right? Are we thinking about our lives might end right then and there? And that is, that right there is privilege. And I think um, answering this question is simply like, having these open conversations and really recognizing and listening to what is going on and what is at stake. Um, and then also recognizing, you know, your own, um, own, the own privilege, but also like, as, as Jimmy alluded to, the, the, the truth of the matter is, and in the, in the Asian community, oftentimes historically, there is a lot of anti-black sentiment and you have to, you have to dig deep, get to the bottom that have those difficult conversations with others and then that's where you emerge from all of this. Um, and it's frustrating and it's so difficult, but solving race, <laughs> racial problems, solving racism is not easy. But uh, the first step is certainly listening. I mean, I'll add, you know, having the empathy and the open mind is so important and having the discussions. I mean, for me, a, a hobo was about eight or nine years ago when a couple of uh, my African-American uh, football players told me when other, they leave the Georgetown campus to go into the Georgetown neighborhood, which is like the wealthiest neighborhood in, in, uh, in DC, they actually change out of their hoodies and their sweats and they put on khakis and golf shirts because they don't want to get pulled over or whatever. And like, I never knew, right? And I shared that with my Asian students who are, you know, you know the prejudice or Asian students, oh, you're really good in math or you're, you're really smart. Asian students don't have to deal with that, right? And so the more that other people understand what the other uh, races go through, it, it does open minds and you, you get you get a better, you know, the, the big picture environment. Uh, guys, I want to start to um, wrap up here because um, we're coming, uh, we're, we're ending here. And I wanted to give um, some time for some final thoughts, um, some parting thoughts um, with this panel. I think, uh, I hope, hope everyone's felt very educated from it. I certainly have been. Um, so final thoughts, uh, Barry, we'll start with you. Um. I guess my final thoughts, just reiterating the point on, um, you know, just you have to be aggressive and proactive in your own career. Um, you know, you can't necessarily rely, like it, it's good to find people, network and find people that'll help you. But the thing is, in order to find those people, in order to be in that position, you have to be the person that puts yourself out there. So, you know, really just be proactive. Um, really look for those opportunities. The more you, more times you take a shot, the sooner or later you'll you'll land the bullseye uh jimmy uh, i'll say you know follow your area of passion um you know trying to be consistent with that i mean you know carrie you talked about that mid-career change but if you're in your 30s and all, all of a sudden you want to make a switch to sports it's going to be hard right but like someone like kim or like myself that started sports at the beginning of our career are, are built our way up is so definitely follow an area of passion do what you want to do but also make sure you have mentors in your life because they, they can make all the difference and really learn how to network, like stretch yourself, get out of the comfort zone. So if you embrace passion and networking, um, you know, it, it's going to make a big difference in your life. Yeah, I would say pursuing your passion. Um, you know, a lot of people in my business feel like they don't go to work every day. And so when you feel like that, that you're having a pretty good life. Um, and, you know, in Barry's point, you know, being aggressive um, and trying to get into the business, you know, if you truly love it, it's not going to feel like you're being aggressive. It's just going to feel like you're going after what you want. And so I think that, um, you know, it's important because, you know, ev every day in your life matters. Uh, ab absolutely. Um, I did want to mention for the, um, from a mentorship standpoint, if you're interested in sports journalism, Go to Twitter and follow at AAJA Sports. Um, we'll get in touch. I'll pair you up with the right people. Heck, I might even pair you up with the people on this panel. Um, they didn't even realize that they've been uh, become mentors, but uh, <laughs> lo and behold. 
Um, also did want to mention really quickly, um, we didn't, unfortunately, we weren't able to have a South Asian rep on today's panel. And it's merely a product of not being able to have X amount of panelists that we wanted to. But I did want to shout out what the South Asians are doing in sports. And there's a great resource. Check out S-A-I-N, South Asians in Sports. Dot com, same sports.com um, to see what's going on in the South Asian community. So um, on behalf of everyone, I, I want to say thank you. And then I want to toss it back to uh, Madeline. Thank you, Carrie, for leading us through this discussion today and to our panelists for bringing such um, expertise and insight um, to this discussion. Thank you. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, thank you again to our panel, panel sponsor, Walmart, for their support of this event. Uh, starting next week, our legislative leadership series moves to two panels per week. So join us next week for a conversation on veterans and the workforce uh, next Wednesday on September 9th. And then again for an important and very timely panel on voting rights and challenges in the 2020 election on Thursday, September 10th. You can register for these and other remaining policy discussions, including topics such as gender equity, housing issues, immigration, civil rights, and others at the APEX website. And we also invite you to join us for APEX celebration, Asian prom, going virtual, register so that you can join us on October the 1st. You can RSVP to participate in, in all of these exciting events on the APEX website at www.apex. Org. Enjoy the rest of your day and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.